Okay, let's go ahead and begin. Welcome everyone to this webinar discussion on civil society participation in the COVID-19 response. This discussion is being hosted by the Civil Society Engagement Mechanism and the Social Participation Technical Network of UHC 2030. The webinar is being recorded. Um, both the audio and the recording will be available on the CSCM website at cscmonline.net. We will begin this session with a series of presentations and to maintain proper ba bandwidth uh, connection, we would ask that those of you who are using video, if you could please switch to audio, um, we would really appreciate that. In the second half of this session, we'll provide participants with an opportunity to ask questions. Please keep your audios muted and use the chat box, func chat box function to ask your questions throughout the presentation and during the Q&A. When you're typing your question in the chat box, please make sure that you select everyone in the two line. Um, and this is to ensure that everybody can see your question. So without further ado, I'll, I'd like to present our moderator for today, Justin Coonan. Justin is the president of ACON. He's an advisory group member for the CSCM. He also represents civil society on the UHC 2030 steering committee and is also co-chair on the social participation technical network of UHC 2030. Justin, thank you so much for moderating today's session. I'm gonna hand over the audio to you so we can begin. Just one minute. Go ahead. Oh, I think we're fighting with the audio. <laughs> Hello, I there think you go. I'm now unmuted. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Hello and uh, welcome everyone. I'm in Sydney, Australia. I know that you are all over the world and it's fantastic to have you. I also know that uh, it's an extremely challenging and uh, very busy time for probably everyone on this call. So we really appreciate you making the time to, to join us this evening, morning, wherever you are. Um, and it's quite a remarkable time too. If we go back a little bit, uh, just over six months ago, we saw uh, the, most, the, the broadest, most comprehensive political declaration on health ever seen at the global level at the UN high level meeting on universal health coverage uh, at UNGA last September, uh, which was a commitment from the world's leaders to leave no one behind to ensure that every person around the world had access to essential health services uh, in a way that wouldn't put them at financial disadvantage. Uh, and perhaps far sooner than we've expected, we've seen a real test of that commitment. Uh, and in fact, we've seen which countries uh, are better prepared and which are not, and that sometimes it's not the countries you might expect. And critically in, in that declaration was a commitment to engage all stakeholders, including the civil societies and communities, including the private sector and academia as appropriate, uh, through the establishment of participatory and transparent uh, multi-sector multi -sector and multi-stakeholder platforms and partnerships. Uh, so really a commitment to uh, engage across the spectrum. And critical to this discussion, I think, is the realization that if we are to leave no one behind, in general, but in particular in the COVID response, if we're going to make sure that everyone around the world uh, gets what they need or as much as possible in the COVID response, it is a realization that civil society and communities are critical precisely because they are in the position to reach the most, for the, the, the people most likely to be left behind to speak the language of and to relate to the most vulnerable and the most marginalized. And so, uh, the Social Participation Technical Network and CSEM, the Civil Society Engagement Mechanism of, of UHC 2030, decided to hold this webinar for us to come together and take stock of where civil societies and civil society and communities are at in the global COVID response. Uh, the extent to which uh, governments are including them in responses, the ways in which they're uh, responding in novel and, and innovative ways, and uh, as much as it is to hear from, from experts, and we have a stellar lineup of ex experts uh, to speak with us, it's also to hear from you uh, about the questions you have about what you're doing. And I, I, I want to reiterate Eliana's point in that, that 
Uh, so we'll be taking questions and comments in the chat box, but everything that's there will be recorded and will be used to inform uh, our future work, both within CSIM and the Social Participation Technical Network. So please keep the comments and questions coming. Um, do that as they come up, uh, as you hear the presenters. We will probably wait until the end of all the presentations to have a broader Q&A, but please keep the questions uh, and the comments coming the whole way through. So I won't say any more, uh, except how excited we are to have this uh, amazing lineup of people who've agreed to speak with us tonight. Uh, I'll introduce them one by one, but uh, we wanted to start with really a voice from the front lines. Uh, and so we're, we're thrilled to have Evelyn Carrijo here. Uh, Evelyn, as, as you can see now from the slides, which you should, uh, should be able to see, uh, is a CSIM advisory group member. Uh, she's also alternate uh, steering committee member on the UHC 2030 steering committee for civil society organizations of the global south. And very importantly, she represents young people. She's a director uh, at Youth in Action House at AMREF in Nairobi, Kenya. So I'm going to hand over to you, Evelyn Jumbo. Uh, great to have you here. Uh, let's hear what's happening in Kenya and across Af Africa with young people. Thanks. Thank you, Justin. Hello, everybody. I'm calling in from Nairobi, Kenya. Uh, Justin, as you've mentioned, civil societies are playing an amazing role in supporting the efforts to combat the pandemic. But the narrative and story that really deserves our attention right now, and as you've rightly put it, is that of the youth. Because we are talking about um, the biggest population right now globally of young people at about 1.8 billion. Um, young people. Um, Eliana, if we can go to the next slide, please. In Africa, we are looking at uh, about 75% of the population uh, that's aged below the age of 35. That's around 900 million young people. But beyond these numbers, it's important to note that in many regions, and especially um, in the global south, young people are the most vulnerable. We as young people have the poorest health indicators, the lowest incomes, young people are three times more likely to be unemployed compared to adults. So we've been through too much. And honestly, right now, the last thing anyone would want is a pandemic because uh, we'll clearly bear the brunt. But this is happening, and this is the reality for us as young people. On the flip side, youth organizations and youth civil society move movements provide an opportunity for mass activation, for mobilization, and the young people have the biggest potential to stop the spread of the pandemic. Now, a few governments have been able to leverage on this opportunity um, that young people bring. In Kenya, our government made a passionate appeal earlier uh, this month to young people to bear the force supporting their efforts to end the pandemic. And we've seen a youth engagement task force being set up uh, by the Ministry of Health the Division of Community Health Services, we've seen governments at county level, which is the subnational level, setting up um, task forces and committees that include young people and enable their voices to be heard as policies are being developed around COVID-19. And this has gone a long way in ensuring that um, there's awareness creation amongst the youth population, but has also gone a long way in ensuring that young people are adopting positive behavior change with regards to social distancing and hand and face hygiene. We can move to the next slide. Um, what's inspiring is that through the crisis, young activists and youth volunteers are innovating. They're generating ideas in their own spaces to end the pandemic. So earlier this month, uh, Y Act Youth in Action in collaboration with other youth-led and youth-serving organizations across the country launched uh, the hashtag Champion Square Ground campaign. And this campaign is aimed at amplifying the voices and efforts of the youth and youth-led organizations at grassroots level who are making incredible contributions in the fight to end the pandemic. We received overwhelming responses um, online when we asked young people to talk about their stories and talk about what they're doing to end the pandemic. So what I've included there is just a glimpse and some of the highlights from this campaign. 
in three categories. The first is on youth health workers. What was interesting was that young people actually nominated most health workers as champions. And we acknowledge that 50% of the champions who were nominated were health workers in the front line to end the pandemic. This showed that young people have the potential to advocate for the rights of health workers. Uh, we've seen youth organizations in Kenya engaging government through task forces to advocate for adequate resource allocation for PPEs for young health workers and being able to ensure that resources are allocated for training health workers. So as youth, we're also being that voice to ensure that health workers, who the majority are actually young, are being uh, prioritized in the policies that are being set up. The second category is on grassroots youth organizations. It was exciting to see stories that were put forward of youth organizations that are leveraging their creativity through art, through murals, through music, to create awareness on COVID-19. But beyond COVID-19, young people are using their creativity to talk about emerging issues and needs of the youth. We have seen youth organizations such as Usikimye, so now we're really talking about uh, the increased cases of sexual and gender-based violence that's affecting young people in Kenya. We've seen young people who stepped up to protect others during the unfortunate events of police, police brutality that we saw um, in the initial days of the curfew. And subsequently, these young people set up information desks in these hotspot areas to sensitize residents on preventive measures of COVID-19 and how to adhere to directives that are being given uh, by government and of course by different stakeholders. On the third category, we have youth innovators. Uh, we received stories of civil societies working with young people at grassroots level to make their own homemade soap. And this went a long way in generating income. We've seen young people being able to get income from the sale of this locally made uh, soap. And in that end, they've been able to buy and purchase other protective gear, including masks. So civil societies working with grassroots youth-led organizations have enabled the youth to not just get an alternative source of income, but ensure that they are adequately protected you know, in this time of the pandemic. So beyond our campaign, uh, we've seen around the world, and even in the global south, Youth, youth movements embracing digital media to make their voices heard and to spark collective action around COVID-19 at a time when really everybody needs it the most. We've seen young people taking on to the internet and to different social media platforms to take on challenges for wearing the mask, to showcase how they're dealing with social distancing. And that has gone a long way in ensuring that young people adopt positive behavior and that uh, the youth and grassroots youth-led organizations are able to encourage each other to adhere to the directives that are being given uh, by different governments. On the next slide. Now, the WHO has been calling for shared responsibility and global solidarity because the long-lasting impact of this pandemic will surely go beyond the demographic losses. And for the youth, it, this means that, you know, we'll be affected um, and we're looking at all spheres of the economy, social, cultural dimensions. So it's, it's important that we become cognizant of the different barriers that young people are facing to active participation in the fight against COVID-19, but also emerging challenges that young people are facing. The first is information and useful resources on youth efforts are scattered. And we've heard this a lot from young people. They're saying there's a lot of information out there, but there's no single platform that collects this information and resources for young people to be able to engage effectively in the fight to end this pandemic. Um, the second challenge that we are seeing, the second and the third actually, imminent decline in and loss of income, as well as priorities and the fact that as young people, uh, the basic priority right now is getting and finding a living and a source of income vis-a-vis -vis maintaining social distancing. So it doesn't matter that um, right now the biggest percentage of young people are unemployed. We are still required to uh, stay at home during the curfew hours. We are still required to maintain social distancing. And this becomes a really big barrier um, to our lives and to the economic empowerment of young people. 
on the fourth uh, barrier, we've seen displacements of health services. If you look at previous pandemics that have happened in the global south, for example, the Ebola pandemic that we had in 2015, uh, the shift in focus of the health systems towards preventing and treating uh, people who are affected then causes a displacement in health services. And for young people, this means that most youth are not able to get routine health services such as sexual and reproductive health services, contraception, routine services around mental health have actually been displaced. And we're seeing this affecting young people. The fifth is on increased cases of sexual and gender-based violence. I think I already talked about this and we're seeing an imminent increase in the rise of teenage pregnancies at this time. So then what do we need to do and how do we um, come up with collective action? Uh, we can move to the next slide. The first is on innovation and technology. I already spoke about this, but just to reinforce that as economies are being impacted, it's important for youth organizations to advocate for policies, that provide the needed environment, not just for innovation, but to move innovation to scale. We are seeing youth innovators right now who are developing and coming up with ventilators. So how do we ensure that we maintain this policy environment that will allow young people to innovate even beyond COVID-19? That should be the first consideration for a collective responsibility. Uh, the second slide, please. We need alternative policies that support youth health and economic priorities. We need to be able to look at future trends and the young people should be at the fore of ensuring that we advocate for policies right now to be cognizant of our needs. We're looking at um, increased cases of teenage pregnancies. We're looking at having unwanted um, and high incidence of HIV and AIDS. So um, as youth advocates, we need to be able to advocate for policies right now to be cognizant of our needs. We're also looking at social protection of young people and the fact that um, unemployment is quite rampant, especially in the global south. The third point, please. On movement building for advocacy, we need young people to be viewed positively. And I have to say that in the recent past, young people have not been viewed really positively. And uh, most stakeholders in government are calling out to youth and saying that we are the ones defying directives and being a barrier to, end it to, to the efforts that are being put in place to end the pandemic. So we need a collective movement of youth organizations to change this narrative, to show the amazing work that the youth are doing and to show that the youth are responsible citizens. We need the youth to be at the fore of combating discrimination and stigma. We also need a platform for all our youth resources and for these success stories to be shared. So at the moment we are working on a global platform that will be available to young people, not just in the global south, but in the global north. We are working with UNFPA and we hope to put together resources that young people are going to use and will find useful uh, in their day-to-day -day lives as they try to combat um, the spread of the pandemic. For the last point, please. On partnerships, uh, we've seen young organ youth organizations working very well with um, other stakeholders, including the private sector. And right now, the youth should be able to advocate uh, for policies to be able to accommodate the provision of products for young people. For example, subsidize the sanitary towels for young girls. And we cannot do this without partnerships. So we're calling on all partners to support the youth organizations, um, including the private sector, to work with us. Right now, um, I'll give a case in point where in Kenya, we're working with Procter & Gamble. Uh, to be able to supply sanitary towels to vulnerable girls in our communities. So that's it for my presentation. As a parting short point, I just want to mention that youth should not be left behind and we should continue playing an active role in the fight um, to end COVID-19. Uh, if you want to get in touch with us and find out more about the resources that we are putting up, please contact us uh, at youth.advocacy.com or on my personal email address that's showing on your screens right now. Thank you.
Thanks, Evelyn. That was fantastic and uh, amazing to see how much you and your colleagues are doing. And you're right that that uh, the youth in many ways are really leading this response, which is wonderful. Uh, I'm sure people have questions and comments. Uh, I said we'd leave them from to the end, but I do just want to pick on one thing you said, because I think it's going to be a key theme moving forwards uh, for how civil society and communities uh, play their accountability role. You mentioned the issue of human rights abuses. Um, many of you might have seen the UNAIDS reports, which was a uh, recent UNAIDS uh, release, which was quite shocking about the ways in which some governments around the world are using, seem to be using COVID-19 as a cover uh, to perpetrate human rights abuses against the people who, who live in their, in their countries. And that's a real cause for concern. Could you just say something about uh, the human rights situation in Kenya or the countries you're working in and what, if anything, you're doing to hold governments accountable to make sure that human rights are respected? Thanks. Thanks, Justin. I'll just uh, respond briefly to mention that civil societies are playing an active role to advocate for human rights to be respected. Uh, there are mistakes that have been made uh, by governments and uh, even in Kenya, the president came out to apologize for um, any brutality that was experienced <clears throat> as we were having our initial um, instance of the curfew. Uh, but uh, what I want to the state is that civil society have been at the fore of advocating for human rights to be respected. And we are glad that we are seeing a positive response from the government. As I mentioned earlier, young people came out to protect each other. It was a new situation. And so um, it wasn't surprising to see um, the brutality that was experienced in the very beginning. Uh, but what we really appreciated was the fact that apologies were made and that efforts are being put in place to ensure that human rights are being respected moving forward. Fantastic, thanks. And as, I, as we've said, I'm sure there'll be more discussion on this later. Please start your comments and your questions, anything that, that uh, comes up in response to what you're hearing from the panelists. Let's move on now and then we'll come back to discussion later. We're again thrilled uh, to have with us Rob Yates, Executive Director uh, at the Center for Universal Health at, at Chatham House. Um, many of you will know, but perhaps some of you will not, Chatham House is one of the UK's and really one of the world's leading independent think, think tanks. And so, and so it's a, a great crew that we could have Rob to join us now. And as you can see, he's gonna be talking about uh, the various roles that civil society might have in tackling COVID-19. Uh, and linking that back to UHC. So over to you, Rob. Thanks, thanks very much indeed. And, and thank you as well, Evelyn, for your wonderful presentation. And I think very important emphasizing the importance of the economic impact on, on the youth, you know, that certainly with unemployment is, is uh, very severe at the moment. Um, and greetings from uh, Chatham House, the Centre on Universal Health at Chatham House in London, which, uh, as you might be able to see, isn't actually strictly true because I'm speaking to you from lockdown in southwest London, like, like the, the whole capital here. And, and delighted to be speaking to you and greatest sympathies for, for everyone who's being affected by this terrible pandemic. Um, I'd like to talk to you for the next uh, five, ten minutes um, about, yes, the role of civil society in tackling COVID-19 but also not forgetting perhaps, you know, the, the, the longer term goal of accelerating progress to universal health coverage. And I think how important it is to link these two agendas together at the, this time. And we shouldn't sort of ditch the UHC agenda just to be uh, thinking about COVID-19. And in many respects, you know, this actually does prove the ultimate test for UHC system. And, and therefore this is going to increase our advocacy uh, to reach uh, UHC. Uh, so if we can go to the first slide, please, uh, Eliana. Ooh, yeah, that's it. Uh, so um, clearly, um, civil society has a massive role to play in tackling the immediate battle with COVID-19. I mean, sort of given the enormous role that civil society organisations are playing in health sectors all around the world from all income levels, um, but also beyond that to other social sectors as well, we can see 
that there is going to be a, a massive role really as a direct service provider, uh, a provider of health services. And as I mentioned, that, that um, you might re be thinking that COVID-19 is, is like the ultimate test for an entire UHC system because, you know, we need effective um, public health services, health promotion services about hand washing and spreading messages around the population, around uh, social distancing where that's necessary, um, in providing preventive health services. And you can see that, you know, that when hopefully a, a new vaccine comes along, how vitally important it is that everybody receives that, that vaccine. So there'll be a, a huge role for community health workers, many employed by civil society organizations to, to be giving out those, those vaccines. And also ensuring that people, everyone gets the curative services they need, the treatment services, including in, in say, intensive care units. But not, of course, forgetting that, you know, sadly there are going to be people who are going to succumb uh, to the virus uh, who will need palliative care. And the civil society plays a massive role, not least in this country through the hospice movement in providing palliative care. So just in the health sector, we can see that all civil society organizations involved in healthcare at the moment are going to have an enormous role. But this is much bigger than a health problem, as, as you know, is absolutely obvious and is affecting every other single sector, be it sort of education and anything to do with the economy. And again, civil society will have a massive role in helping strengthening social safety nets, which are so vital at this time with people's uh, jobs disappearing and unemployment increasing, potentially poverty increasing, and governments making attempts to sort of try and get cash payments to people uh, to ensure that everyone gets this support that they need at this very difficult time. And again, CSO's role is going to be invaluable in, in really, really finding the poor and vulnerable, um, you know, helping disabled people get services, you know, sort of ensuring that, that um, you know, gender based services are, are sort of uh, fully resourced as, as well. So that, you might say, is the first part of, you know, where civil society is going to be engaged. But I think as well, and just as importantly, it's about civil society holding governments and partners to account. Um, you know, at these difficult times when resources are constrained and, and uh, decisions are being made about allocation of scarce uh, resources, it's vital that civil society is holding governments to account and making sure that nobody is left behind. And of course, you know, that means supporting, making sure that you know, vulnerable groups that have got, got a history of being left behind, uh, the homeless, refugees, migrants, you know, are not being left behind. And, and uh, civil society, I think, are the watchdogs that, that are needing to make sure that, you know, engaging the media, uh, that, that um, people are, are fully focusing on services get, getting to everyone. And I think civil society should be um, right in the thick of, of campaigning for policies that we know do exclude people. And uh, the most obvious one being user fees, healthcare user fees that in effect are a tax on the sick and the poor and stop people getting services. Now is not the time to be rationing services. Uh, and you know, that this is, exactly the time to be ramping up campaigns to abolish healthcare user fees and other human rights abuses associated with healthcare. And I just want, oh, next slide please, uh, Eliana, if you may, because I just want to highlight uh, a couple of, of examples. You know, the, the, and these are just examples. One is the issue of hospital detentions. You know, that there are some countries where people who can't pay their hospital fees are locked up for months on end until their families find the money to, to, to bail them out. Now, clearly in an environment or a situation where you have a pandemic, uh, to have valuable hospital beds of people sort of being locked up because they can't pay their bills is absolutely outrageous. And Human Rights Watch back in the, in the mid 2000s produced a fabulous report showing that this was happening in Burundi, brought it to the attention of the president the president was horrified to find out this had happened. 
not only ban medical detentions, but launch universal free health care for pregnant women and children. A very good example of CSO advocacy sorting that problem out, but we know this happens in other countries. And another example I, I only heard about uh, last week when I saw this newspaper article that in Ghana, uh, people are being charged to use hospital washrooms. You know, their patients and their relatives are being charged to use washrooms in hospitals. Now, clearly, in a, in a pandemic, this doesn't make any sense whatsoever. So I would say that civil society organizations, this is a recommendation in Ghana, maybe should be campaigning to stop this, but then maybe broadening it out to really question whether user fees should be being charged in hospitals at all at this time. Uh, next slide, please. But those are just a couple of examples to, to be thinking about. But I would also like to emphasize that I think that now is the time that we should be being big and bold on this and, and not just restricting ourselves to discussions around uh, COVID-19 and its impact. Because now is the time to be championing UHC reforms to political leaders. Because clearly this virus and illness threatens everybody's health and everyone's well-being and requires this universal response. We even have heads of state, not you know, like our prime minister here, uh, Boris Johnson, um, who's currently sick at the moment, still with the uh, recovering from the virus. So it's in everyone's minds, you know, that we must protect ourselves. And heads of state are under an immense pressure to deliver results quickly to help benefit the population, in particular around giving people access to healthcare and financial protection. So really, this is, you know, UHC, you know, the, you know, sort of people are putting pressure on their heads of state to deliver UHC reforms. And we've seen that UHC reforms can deliver results quickly in giving people access to healthcare and in giving them financial protection. So in many respects, some of the world's greatest UHC successes have come out of the most extraordinary crises. Um, there's a very good example that Sri Lanka's health reforms emerged out of a, a brutal malaria epidemic in the 1930s. So that's a very good example. Um, the UK, France and Japan, our UHC health systems came out of the Second World War when our countries were basically bankrupt and dependent on US aid. And we were able to launch our uh, UHC reforms very quickly coming out of that crisis. Thailand launched its UHC reforms coming out of the Asian financial crisis. Rwanda uh, did off the, the back of the terrible genocide of the, of the mid-1990s. So you can see that even in times of great crisis, politicians are prepared to launch UHC reforms. Uh, next slide, please. In fact, final slide, I think. So I think the question is that as we're working and, and you know, sort of getting access to, to uh, heads of state on this issue, where might be the countries that we could be encouraging the governments to come out of this COVID crisis, launching big, bold UHC reforms? And I've just suggested a few here that maybe sort of callers on uh, the call today might be interested uh, to discuss. Ireland, for example, you can see as forming a new government at the moment, and there are discussions about launching UHC reforms um, coming out of this crisis. South Africa, where the NHI is going through Parliament, I think it's a country that could easily launch UHC reforms. Uh, Evelyn might have um, um, comments about Kenya, um, you know, which was piloting UHC reforms in, in four counties. And you know, maybe is that you know, the time that President Kenyatta wants to go national on, on this approach coming out of this crisis. Indonesia, Bangladesh, Sudan, Ghana, um, these are all countries that, you know, sort of that we're watching and thinking there could be maybe an opportunity to pitch this to their heads of state. And even the United States, um, you know, which, which of course, uh, in many respects, is seeing large increases in people losing health coverage at the moment as unemployment rates increase but we're all aware elections coming up at the end of the year. So now might be the time for politicians to be much bolder on, on this. So, and of course, now is the time with governments and donors throwing billions of dollars at this crisis. Uh, a lot of it going to health sectors, a lot of it looking at financial protection. This is a good opportunity 
for us to say, well, some of this money should be reserved for UHC reforms. And in the words of one of our great leaders who, um, who became sort of famous in the UK, of course, for his performance in the Second World War, when presented with situations like this, would say, never let a crisis go to waste. And, you know, the, the, you know, this is the time, I think, to be promoting UHC reforms. So I think that as well as CSOs being in the front line, you know, sort of really engaging in, in the pandemic, you know, we have this vital role in championing the merits of UHC at the highest levels of government, including heads of state. And that's something that we at Chatham House are very keen to support and work with all CSOs on. And I know that's the case of the elders as well, who are talking to various heads of state about this at the moment. So uh, next slide and final slide, please, to, to conclude. Rick, and th that's it really, healthcare can't wait. So I, I think you know, that, you know, this is the message that we should be pitching. And, and just to say that if you want to follow me on Twitter, I, I, I put out news stories along these lines on a, on a daily basis and be glad to sort of share this information with you if you'd like to join. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks to all. Thanks very much, Rob. We're going to hire you as our advocate in chief. Uh, and, and for those of you who haven't followed Rob on Twitter, he's, he's uh, extremely proficient. Uh, puts out a lot of material and it's all really good so i would highly encourage that um this is a little bit perhaps unfair because i haven't told you i'm going to ask you this but but just listening to what you've said rob um what are there are there some good examples you've seen about sort of what sort of structures work in terms of the the, the relationship between civil societies and governments is this about institutionalizing the role of civil society in government processes or is that can work in some cases, but not others. I'm just wondering if you can think of some good examples of, of where this kind of advocacy has been effective and what it looks like. Uh, yes, definitely. And, and it's, it's gonna vary from country to country, you know, and the, the degree of space that, that civil society is, is allowed to, to operate in. And, you know, unfortunately, I think you're sort of seeing in some countries that, that space being shut down. And I think that, you know, to be frank, that's happening in India at the moment. And in other situations, it, it opens up. And, you know, I, I think that the Thai example is extremely good, you know, sort of where, you know, that they had a sort of, I think, a law that if a certain number of signatories, um, you know, was put forward for a bill that Parliament would have to debate it. And civil society working with those great pioneers of UHC, people like Dr. Suet and Dr. Varosh, who we all know very well, you know, engineered it that that happened and put it on the agenda and, and you know, civil society has a very strong role in the entire uh, Thai UHC reforms. So it is going to depend uh, to some extent from country to country, but, but you know, I, I think this is where civil society organisations can learn from each other. And even in situations that it might not appear promising to be thinking that this is a political process and as well, of course, as, you know, say, maybe working with the incumbent government, you might be work wanting to be work with opposition political leaders as well uh, and putting it on their agenda, particularly if you have elections coming up. So we, we have to engage in the politics. There's just no, no two ways about it. And just like that last slide shows, you know, that might even take, you know, taking to the streets to protest. We, we do it in the UK. And, you know, if you can do it, I, I would recommend doing it. Brilliant. Thank you very much uh, for that, Rob. And we'll come back to you with some more questions and comments uh, in a minute. Uh, and it's fortuitous that you mentioned the Thai example. That wasn't planned, uh, although you might have had an inkling of what's coming next. But we're really lucky uh, also to have with us uh, Dr. Preda Tayarak, Deputy Secretary General of the National Health Commission in Thailand. And just looking at the list of people online, I can see we have some others from the National Health Commission. I think Dr. Wirasak, you're there, and Anut, you're there, I know. And Thailand has certainly been one of those countries which uh, has managed to integrate the role of communities and civil societies in a very real way. Um, so uh, it's a privilege to have you, Dr. Preda. Um, uh, I would like to hand over to you, Sawadee Kaap. Uh, let's hear from Thailand. Hi, Sawadee Kaap. I'm Dr. Prida, 
uh, from Thailand. Thank you for inviting me to join the web webinar here. Um, as you, you, you can see the first slide, uh, we have the plan of the synergy of active citizens to help the country. Uh, sorry, uh, yeah, okay, the first slide. Um, as we know, the medical personnel are a hero of this pandemic all over the world and also in Thailand. In fact, there are many silent heroes fighting this COVID-19. Thailand has around 1 million health and other volunteers have worked side by side with health personnel. The health volunteers have knocked the door almost 12 million households to provide them for the correct information about the COVID-19 and check dwellers' health condition while others contribute to various activities concerning COVID-19 issues such as screening at the checkpoint, making the, the, the face mask, producing other activities and uh, some material that uh, to be used in, uh, in the activity in the community. The government in Thailand played a big role to control the spread of COVID-19. Currently, the government has declared a national state of emergency effective on 26th of March. Several provinces have closed their border. Visitors from abroad or Thai people coming back from abroad have to be, have to be quarantined for four days uh, as uh, occur in many countries. This measure also applies inter-provincial travel in some provinces too. We cancel Thai New Year holiday during 13 to 15 April that uh, the famous uh, festival we call Songkran festival in Thailand. But now the first year that we can sell this, this uh, important holidays. No alcohol selling during that period. Okay, uh, from this slide, the second slide here, uh, you can see uh, we use the crucial strategy. The crucial strategy in Thailand that uh, Thai CSO use is uh, to make the government measure works is to get the cooperation from the people. We synergize active citizens together with all stakeholders in every sub-district. In Thailand, we have the province and district and the uh, local level we call sub-district. <clears throat> in every sub-district, we encourage the civil group to initiate their own activities to cope with this crisis side by side with the central government and local authority. Uh, actually, fortunately for Thailand that we uh, accumulate social capitals for many years, we let CSOs participate a process of developing a participatory public policy under local wisdoms so many years. We have organized the National Health Assembly as well as Provincial Health Assembly, where the government officer meet and discuss health-related issue with the CSOs and academia in accordance with the National Health Act. And at the sub-district level, we encourage CSOs and community organization to develop their health charter together with a local government and local academia as a social contract for community health. Both health assembly, health charter, create a sense of social responsibility and corrective leadership to, so, 
problem in Thai society. However, in the time of this crisis, at the national level, we have uh, 12 organizations from health field, social development field, media field, and administration field that we agree to co collaborate and to support the community people to solve their problem. The main objective is to transform citizens to be literate in health and active in contributing to society as well as to comply with the government measures. Once again, to comply with the government measures. At the same time, information and recommendation from the sub-district level are expected to transfer to district, provincial, and national level for decision making. And uh, from country level, drill down and uh, to the sub-district level. In the same time, the information and the opinion from the local people from the bottom can uh, come up to the central level also. Next slide, please. Here, you can see the priority area is the sub-district level of our strategy now since it has an appropriate size in terms of the population and geographical area that is uh, feasible to organize such as activities under social distancing measure. We also encourage provincial health assembly and district quality of life board to support the movement of the sub-district level. And there are some provinces that work very well. Next slide, please. Here you can see uh, this is the main focus in the sub district level. And you see in the uh, yellow block, you can see local authority and uh, hospital or health volunteer and the citizen and civil society, we call the triangle to move the difficult things in a Thai problem. And at the central, you can see the local health fund. It is the strong, the strength of Thai community that every sub-district, we have local community fund come from National Health Security Office and come from uh, local administration uh, uh, development office. So the people in this field at the local community, they can involve in mobilize uh, local resources and mobilize their manpower and mobilize activities. And uh, you can see on the right hand side, uh, the, the green box, the output of our uh, activities. Now, we hope that at the local activities and local movement, all local part partic participants, all local uh, government and people organization, they will have the social contract. They have joint agreement, community charter, and they can set their own agenda. Next slide, please. Here is the important factor that uh, I think uh, play important role in the uh, success of our uh, government measure and it works well in, uh, in the community level. The four factors, the first one, 
is an enabling policy that has promoted collaboration between the government, local government, civil society, and academia for such a long time. And in Thai context, we have the existing participatory platforms available at our administrative level. Second, we have sufficient and competent workforce from the government side as well as civil society like that can implement immediately in the time of crisis. We have long invested in strengthening the capacity of civil society and the community involvement. The third factor, we have local funds, both health and social, available in the community that civil society and community member can join and make their decision on how to spend it to benefit their community. And the fourth one is the Thai culture with sharing and helping one of another is a key element that many people gather to help the ones in need as well as health personnel. Okay, finally, I think that if the country does, if all country or some country doesn't have this technical and social capitals, don't worry, it's difficult to set it up. It's not so difficult to set it up, uh, especially in the time of crisis because everyone, everyone wants to, to talk to the other, to solve the crisis problem. And it's not too late to start it now because it, that is the right time indeed to bring the power of the people, the power of civil society to work side by side with the government and other sectors too. For example, academia and private sector to control the spread of virus and reduce the impact of COVID-19. And we hope that by empower the people in the community to cooperate with the government sector and the civil sector will come up with the success of the campaign or activities that we can solve the COVID-19 crisis now. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Preeta. That was wonderful to hear what Thailand's doing and certainly in the social participation uh, work that's happening within the technical network and the WHO, uh, the Thai example is one of the preeminent ones. And I think what, uh, what your presentation really brought out uh, is that Thailand already has this system of social participation and has for many years. And there's, I see there was a comment, uh, is this, has this just all been set up for COVID or, uh, or is it something that exists more broadly? And I think the answer is it's more broad. And because those systems are already in place, they can click into gear when, when, when something like COVID happens. Uh, it's much harder to set up these engagements from scratch uh, from, from the beginning. And it's more a reason why some level of institutional, institutionalization of these relationships um, is potentially really important moving forwards. Now, I'd love to ask lots of more questions, but I know that we have one more presentation um, and then we want to make sure there's sort of half an hour for questions. Um, if you're sending your questions to Eliana, don't worry, she and I have this thing going where I'm receiving them all anyway. So I am seeing them all, that's good, and we will get to them. But I would like to conclude the formal presentations with uh, Eliana. Um, because in this social participation work, we wanted to sort of cast the net fairly broadly and see, okay, what are civil society organizations doing globally and uh, how are they being involved in their government's responses? And so we launched uh, a quick five minute survey, which many of you responded to, it was great. Um, and so Eliana is now going to present briefly the results of that survey. Eliana, hola. 
Hola, thank you very much, Justin. And I know we're running a little behind on time, so I'm gonna to try to get us through these slides quickly. Um, so as Justin said, we released a survey and in total, we re received about 200 responses. Everybody completed the survey 100% from 58 um, different countries. Within a 48 hour time period, we actually received 170, which is pretty amazing. And we just left it open. So we got to 200, which is great. Um, mostly all civil society. So our fir first question was, how has your government given um, civil society the opportunity to provide input to the COVID-19 response? I think I jumped a slide, but that's okay. We'll focus on this. And so in terms of civil society's ability to participate, it sounds like they've had some minor involvement and moderate involvement and then some not at all. Um, in terms of whether the person responding had the opportunity to provide input to the COVID-19 response. So the civil society organization responding, it sounds like 31% had minor involvement. And then we also had some um, not at all and then some moderate involvement. So we can see overall that really there hasn't been a whole lot of opportunities for civil society to engage with government in this COVID-19 response. Um, however, of course, civil society is still very active. Um, for those who are collaborating with government, um, most of the civil society are lending their technical staff, such as infectious disease doctors, lab scientists, and researchers to sit on COVID response committees. Some are developing policy recommendations and briefings, relief programs, um, doing different socioeconomic impact analyses. Um, some governments, and we've heard from, you know, the, uh, the Thai government have done a lot to try to involve civil society in different health assemblies, whether it be virtual, um, somehow online. Um, we've had some civil society organizations actually provide funding directly to governments um, in response to COVID. And then we've had some civil society lend um, their people to do some epidemiological surveillance in identifying hotspots. Um, for those civil society organizations that um, have not had the opportunity to work with governments, they're still operating independently. Um, many of them are implementing different uh, communications programs such as distributing informational awareness materials about COVID. They have different informational campaigns, sensitizing the community, um, combating discrimination and stigma. Um, they're also ensuring the continuity of care and health facil facilities. So ensuring um, that other disease area um, health services are still being offered, um, such as HIV, TB, family planning and reproductive health, um, also providing some psychosocial um, and mental health as well. Um, civil society is also distributing resources and supplies. So actually producing and distributing PPE, face masks, hand washing kits, hand sanitizers. They're dis distributing food, water, and other essential supplies um, to communities, especially because of the stay at home orders. And then civil society, of course, is doing a lot of advocacy for large scale, large scale testing, um, ensuring that community health workers are being trained and have the right supplies, um, advocating for um, women to have access to uh, family planning and reproductive health um, services, advocating for women who are currently suffering from gender-based violence due to a lot of the stay-at-home orders, and then also just fundraising in general for, for the community um, to ensure that they have the supplies that they need to get through this pandemic. So our last question, in your opinion, how is the involvement or lack of involvement of your organization and other civil society in your country uh, impacting the COVID-19 response? So uh, the lack of civil society involvement has resulted in, and we've heard um, from a few of our speakers now, but uh, quite a few human rights violations. Um, First of all, leaving marginalized people behind. Um, a lot of people uh, can't access their treatment. Um, there's been a lot of police brutality, as Evelyn shared with us, um, causing a lot of uh, death. Um, and then there's also shrinking civil society space to really advocate and express themselves during this scary time. Um, there are also 
the lack of CSO involvement has caused negative impacts in the overall COVID-19 response in some countries. It's centralized um, the response process, which has overall slowed the response. Um, civil society is the closest to the communities. And so when government doesn't work with civil society, um, they have a, a, an impediment in accessing these communities. Um, there's also a slowdown in distributing medical supplies um, and medicines. Um, there's a disruption, like we I mentioned earlier, of other essential healthcare services. There seems to be a lack of transparency when government is functioning at a very centralized um, level. Um, there's distrust among the communities, and communities are very disengaged. Um, and then there's just lack of knowledge of what's going on and how they can prevent this. Um, in countries where civil society is being um, uh, collaborating with government to respond, we see that there's a coordinated response, there's increased community engagement and risk communication, there's a lot of inclusivity of the different sectors of the community, um, and then, you know, as I've, I've described earlier, civil society is involved in various advisory and technical committees um, for this response. So that's it for the results of our survey. They'll be posted um, and I will just hand the mic back over to Justin so we can get started on some of these great questions I've been getting. Justin, over to you. Thanks, Eliana. That was really comprehensive and I have lots of questions for you, but uh, let's get on to the questions that all the wonderful participants in this, uh, in this forum have asked. Um, we won't get through them all. We do have them all. They'll influence how we move forwards. But uh, Eliana, if I can suggest that you unmute all of the panelists because we'll go sort of fairly rapidly between them now. We'll just try and be quiet while we're not speaking. So the first is from Fred Osiro from Kenya, a young person from Kenya, uh, your compatriot, Evelyn, um, uh, expressing concern at the, the current torture of Africans in China and the question about what can we do to fight racism through, through government actions. And I think I can say, in my own, you know, we're seeing this in, in, in many places. In my own country, there's been, uh, particularly in the early uh, part of the academic where it was focused on, on China and Wuhan, a lot of racism to people of, uh, of Asian background. And it's not the first time we've seen this. You know, we saw it in, in, in the HIV epidemic where public health was weaponized uh, in a way that allowed people to express other prejudices which were completely unrelated um, to, to the issue at hand. So, Evelyn, if it's okay, I might ask you to have a go first on this one. How do you think we address racism and other prejudices that are, that are being manifested, that are being expressed uh, as, as the virus takes its course? So, Evelyn, maybe you first, and then if any of the other panelists would like to say something. So, let me unmute her again. Can we try and unmute everyone? Or, yeah, we're yeah. all unmuted. Go ahead. Thanks. Sorry for that. That's okay. Well, as you rightly mentioned, it's an unfortunate situation and it's really sad that the pandemic is revealing sides of other, you know, states and people that we hadn't seen before. And it's unfortunate that racism is becoming a big issue for, you know, locals in other countries. Right now, I really believe in youth leadership now more than ever to change this narrative. Um, the fact that as young people we can come out strongly through our collective power and compel governments to do something about putting in place um, policies that ensure protection of our citizens wherever they are across the world. I think that should be a priority. We've seen advocates coming out strongly to um, compel the government, for example, here in Kenya to issue statements and the relevant embassies, for example, in China, to be able to issue statements and assure uh, citizens of their protection. Um, for me right now, advocacy will be the first priority and then of course putting in place uh, policies that protect citizens uh, wherever they are and to ensure that they're able to get services just like any other um, citizen across the globe. Yeah. Thank you. Brilliant. Thanks, Evelyn. And I'm just wondering if any of the other panelists, uh, Rob, Dr. Prida, uh, Eliana, if you'd like to comment on this issue of how we tackle the the sort of the, if you like, the collateral damage, the, the, the racism and the prejudice. And as, as another question has pointed out, that uh, some countries are using COVID-19 as an excuse to imprison anyone who's critical of the government response. So perhaps more broadly, how we ensure that human rights are being respected. 
don't know if any of the other panelists would like to comment. Just well, come in. Del delighted to uh, just uh, and you know that yes, we, you know we just have to you know recognise that you know that sadly there are these elements in society that just when we should be coming together want to divide us and and that that. Uh, you know, with economies being really hit hard at the moment, you know, that, that you know, it's inevitable with, you know, countries are going to go into recession and potentially into, into depressions. And there is this tendency to try and create sort of underclasses and, and to sort of say, you know, this isn't us, this is them and divide societies. We saw this coming out of the, the financial crisis in 2008-9 as well. And this is where we just need to jump on this stuff and, and you know, be really explicit, you know, where you know, there is flagrant racism and, and, you know, the pathetic attempt by Donald Trump to sort of brand this as a Chinese virus and, and things like this. We just need to be really, really vigilant and, and making sure that, you know, that that's challenged at every opportunity. And, you know, we have to be stand up, be accounted at this time. You know, I, I, and sadly, um, you know, I, I think this does require being sort of confrontational against some of this stuff. Uh, but, you know, you know, united civil society can do this. And, and I think, you know that you know this is the time my goodness we do need uh civil society to hold our leaders to account to stop this type of stuff happening yeah great thanks rob um it's uh clearly very concerning and and in fact this is almost exactly our role to to at least raise awareness of what's going on because because quite often nobody else will let's turn to another comment question uh, I can see Ravi Ram has posted a very detailed and, and very useful comment. Hi, Ravi, how are you? Um, there, are, there are many points here, but I think I'm going to pick up, pick up one which relates to some other comments that, that people have made about the role of the private sector. And if I'm reading the, the room correctly, perhaps some concern uh, of the role in the private sector in these reforms, um, potentially the, their capacity to capture government uh, and the result being that, 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 as you mentioned, out of, well, in some cases, out of pocket expenses don't decrease, but ultimately the most marginalized not getting uh, the, the, the support that they deserve. So I wonder if any, any of the panelists would like to comment on their experiences of the private sector, I guess in UHC reforms uh, generally, but, but also more specifically now uh, in relation to COVID. So I'll, I'll open it up to any of the panelists. I'd be happy to get, get the ball rolling on that. I don't say, yeah. but, 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 but I, I think that, you know, the private sector will have a role in, in sort of manufacturing inputs that go to uh, tackle the, the, you know, the crisis, you know, sort of clearly when it comes to um, you know, trying to research effective vaccines and, and you know, produce protective equipment, you know, that, the, you know, the private sectors can have an enormous role in, in, in this, you know, that, that uh, uh, governments are turning to um, the private sector to do that. It, it gets a bit more complicated when it comes to the provision of services and certainly uh, health financing. Um, I, I think that this crisis shows, you know, beyond you know, anything we could imagine, just how important it is to have a publicly financed health system. And, and so, you know, we, we certainly don't want to sort of be encouraged, you know, debates about, you know, now's the move to move to uh, private health insurance. I mean, that, that doesn't make any sense, you know, sort of whatsoever. Uh, but what's interesting is some countries are actually taking this crisis to uh, nationalize big chunks of their private health providers. You know, Spain has done this, Ireland is doing this. Uh, and, you know, the, the sort of countries that want to suddenly increase the, the capacity to be able to deal with more cases might look to doing that. I, I think there could be a very good case for doing this in South Africa, for example. So, you know, now it's all up for grabs, really. So, so you know, now actually could be the time, I think, to uh, force a faster pace of public-private partnership, which might even involve nationalizing big chunks of the private health industry. Great, thanks. So I think I think it's clear. I, I mean that that comment that you made about uh, the need for public financing certainly that's been the position of, of CSM from the beginning that you get to UHC through domestic resource mobilisation uh, through governments and progressive taxation um, and not through other mechanisms. And nevertheless, there there is clearly some role for the private sector in it, and it needs to be regulated in such a way that. It, uh, equity increases and inequity, uh, and inequity decreases. 
Dr. Preda, I'm wondering if you could uh, say something about the role of the private sector in Thailand and how the private sector is regulated and how it contributes. Uh, yes, I, I think in, in Thailand, the government that they get uh, the uh, cooperation from the private sector and all private sector that they, they try they try to support the government measure, even 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 though the the small shop or the company that have to close uh, due to the government uh, measurement. But uh, many sector they they think that if every people and every company cooperate with the government measure, we will come up with the short period of the crisis and we will gain uh, the positive result soon. Uh, for, I would like to give some example on the private sector. Uh, for example, private hospital, they cooperate to the government. Uh, they participate in the universal coverage in the emergency patient. And so all patients of COVID-19 patient uh, that admit at the private hospital, uh, no, 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 no fee, no fee. They, they, the, the private hospital, they charge from the government and the government will pay because we have universal coverage in Thailand. And even though they cannot get the full amount of the the reimbursement they will they they uh, they have the they 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 want to cooperate and share their resources. The second of the private uh, sector uh, in the private hotel, many many private many hotel uh, in every provinces in Thailand, they offer to to use their place the hotel to be uh, we call hospital and uh, just recovery ward for uh, the people that uh, have to uh, quarantine or uh, subside from the acute phase. And the company, most of the company, they try to hold the, their members or uh, their staff uh, with the the some some of the finance financial support from the government and from themselves too, uh, as well as the private sector at the as the uh, civil society uh, at the local community, the local company, and every uh, private sector in every province they donate some uh, of their money or something that they can help. Uh, the people. So the role of private sector in Thailand uh, to cooperate with the government is quite well and we 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 quite happy with uh, all sector in Thailand now. Yeah, great. Really interesting to, to, to hear how, how that collaboration happens in Thailand. Thank you very much, Dr. Preda. Now I want to come, uh, I can see there are many questions which I'll get to, but I want to come particularly to this comment uh, from Latin America. We've tried very hard on this call to have geographical uh, dispersion. I think we have five continents among the speakers and Eliana's from Mexico, but we didn't quite get to, to South America. So I can see quite a long and interesting comment from someone in in, Latin Amer in a Latin American country. I know that my, my colleagues, Javier Belloc and Kurt Frieda uh, are on this call. So maybe it was one of you, apologies, I can't say it. Maybe it was another fabulous participant. But essentially the, the comment, or the, 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 key co the, the key comment that I pick out of this is that a lot of countries are, are really in crisis mode in the moment. You know, they're focusing only on what's immediately under their nose, which is trying to keep as many people alive as possible. Um, do they have the bandwidth in terms of energy, in terms of time, in terms of resources to uh, actually have this much broader conversation about UHC and SCG3? 
Um, and I guess that relates to, to, to a question I had when you were presenting, Rob, but how do we get the timing right in terms of pushing for a much broader agenda? I mean, you have to, on the one hand, take the opportunity you've got, which, I mean, this is in, in, on, on one side, this is a tremendous opportunity for us to advocate. On the other hand, you have to be sensitive to, to the crises that are going on. So maybe I'll turn to you, Rob, first. Do you think countries have, have the bandwidth to do this? And, and how should we sort of sequence our advocacy? Thanks. Uh, th thank you very much. Um, yes, I mean, I, I think they do have the bandwidth and it's almost a case of that the, what they need to do to deal with the crisis is in effect implement, you know, rapid UHC reforms, you know, that, that um, you know, what we're recognising that the, the, the threat that this disease poses is that everyone needs to adhere to the regulations, everyone needs to wash their hands, everyone needs a vaccine when one comes along. And, and, you know, societies are finding it unacceptable that some people will get access to health services and hospital services and potentially ventilators and others will die. So, so heads of state, you know, are, are recognising that they need to extend a broad range of health services for everyone and recognising that, you know, the majority of the population often don't have the money in their pockets to pay for that and out-of-pocket spending is terrible in any case that they, they have to implement UHC reform. So to some extent, if we sort of go to them, you know, with this, you know, complicated UHC language, you know, that there's a danger that they might get um, confused by this. But, but um, you know, I think, you know, what, what we are selling them is a solution to their problem. And, and um, that, that this is the time to be doing it at, at all income levels. So I, I don't see any country in the world that, that isn't in the market at the moment, or at least their heads of state aren't in the market, for some UHC solutions that will not only deal with this crisis, but potentially see them emerging as heroes, le you know, great leaders who have saved the country at the time of greatest need. And in many respects, I think this is our strategy, that we don't terrify leaders, that we encourage them and, and you know, really sort of champion that this could be their, their legacy. This is how they'll go down in history. Great. So you're firmly on the this is our opportunity side, which is certainly mo more motivating than the let's wait around side. Um, maybe, Dr. Preda, if I could ask you, when Thailand instituted uh, universal health coverage, uh, I think it's, am I right to say it wasn't, Thailand wasn't uh, a rich country then or coming from a position of very, uh, of, of great strength. So maybe, maybe what happened in Thailand is an example of how uh, a country can use the challenges it's facing to, to drive UHC reformers. Maybe you can just say a little bit about how that journey happened in Thailand. How did we get to UHC? Thank you. Uh... I, I think uh, about you, you uh, I think that this is the, the important question of the contribution of you in the COVID-19 uh, crisis. In Thailand, I, I think it's it, uh, very lucky that we implement the uh, UHC since uh, 2002. And uh, 16 to 17 years of the development of UHC. So it proved now we have the strong social safety net for all people in Thailand. Even, even uh, we, we are not uh, the, the rich country, just only. Uh, still development country, developing country. I, I think the question for all countries is that if some way or somehow that we, it's not rich or poor, it's not the, it's, it's not the, the, the case, it's not the point, but we can, we can achieve uh, the implement of UHC 
And if some country that will that uh, not start yet, uh, they should start, and it will benefit for the people in the country. Uh, that it proves that Thailand has universal health coverage, and so everybody can access and cover uh, in this crisis very well. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Prida. Um, now, there's another couple uh, sort of theme in some of the questions that that uh, that I'm seeing. Um, there's one question: Are there any online platforms currently active to capitalize on all the resources? You know, the tools, the guides, the strategies, the learnings that are coming from the communities all around the world. Are there examples? And another question earlier on about uh, a similar question, but around: uh, Is there sort of a a place where all the youth are are collating resources? Um, to share, Eliana, if it's okay, I might I might uh, turn to you on this one. I don't know if you know the answer. If there's a pooled resource, but uh, CSEM is certainly oh considering how it can be most useful um, to to the COVID response. And without volunteering, CSEM potentially potentially that is something useful that that could be done. If not by us, by by some of our partners with us, potentially sort of collating resources. Anyway. Eliana, who's uh, running the CSEM Secretariat from Washington, DC. I wonder if you have any comments on that. Not anything that I have seen so far, either through the survey, um, but certainly something that we um, were keen on learning about. And for anybody who has that information, please send it over to CSEM at msh.org so, um, so that we can share it with through our website. Yeah, so I would say to that, uh, if you have resources you want to be shared, um, as you said, as you said, uh, as Eliana said, please send it to uh, send them to CSEM. If you'd like CSEM to be doing this kind of work, please send Eliana a message now. If we get that clear message that that would be useful to to have a sort of a repository to collect these resources, it's certainly something we can look at. Um, 